Hey everyone and welcome. Get ready because we're diving headfirst into the future of business, like really diving deep. We're talking about the data trends that are going to be calling the shots in 2025 and beyond. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're not just going to like name drop these trends. We're going to break them down. We're talking about what they really mean for businesses, where the golden opportunities are hiding. And yeah, even those potential landmines we need to watch out for. That's the good stuff. Exactly. This isn't about gazing into some crystal ball. This is about understanding those forces that are already shaking things up in the business world, how things get done, and most importantly, how you can stay ahead of the game. So let's kick things off with the big kahuna AI. It's everywhere you look these days, right? Totally. And this document we're looking at doesn't sugarcoat it. It highlights just how massive AI is going to be, but then it hits us with a truth bomb. AI is only as good as the data it's fed. It's like that old saying, garbage in, garbage out, right? You can have the slickest, most powerful AI algorithms out there, but if they're chewing on bad data, you know, the incomplete, inaccurate, inconsistent kind, the results are going to be, well, useless. Or even worse, they could send you down the wrong path completely. Okay, makes sense. So how do we build that rock-solid data foundation for AI to thrive? Integration is key. And I'm not just talking about linking your CRM to your email marketing. We're talking about bringing together data from every nook and cranny of your business. Sales, marketing, the finance crew, operations, HR, you name it. Everything. So it's like this massive data party where every department shows up with their information ready to share. That sounds a little chaotic, but also amazing at the same time. It's about tearing down those data silos that have been around forever, right? Because here's the thing, each department's data tells a part of the story, but it's when you piece it all together, that's when the real magic happens. You get the full picture. And that full picture is what fuels the AI, right? It gives it the insights to make those really smart decisions. Exactly. The more data points you feed into your AI, the more it learns and the more accurate its predictions become. For example, imagine your CRM data and your inventory management system could actually talk to each other. Okay, I'm intrigued. Tell me more. You could start predicting demand before it even shows up, optimize that supply chain, and just wow your customers by how well you anticipate their needs. It's like having a crystal ball, but instead of magic, it's just really, really good data. Okay, that's seriously cool. It's like having a sixth sense for your business. But... Hold on, the document doesn't stop there. It throws another curveball our way, treating data as a product itself. Data as a product, they call it, or DAP. And get this, there's also data as a service, or DAP. Now, that's where things get interesting. Businesses are practically sitting on a gold mine of data, and a lot of them don't even realize it. They see data as this byproduct of what they do, but what if they shifted their perspective and started treating it as a valuable asset? a product with its own value. Okay, I'm gonna need an example here. Help me wrap my head around this whole data as a product thing. Sure, let's say you're a company that specializes in analyzing trends on social media. You could package up your insights into a subscription service that other businesses could use. They get those golden insights on customer sentiment, market trends, all of that, and you. You get yourself a brand new revenue stream. That's DOS as in action. So instead of just selling, let's say, marketing software, you're selling the intel that makes that software smarter. Exactly. Or think about a company with a massive database of consumer purchasing behavior. They could anonymize and package that data, then turn around and sell it to market research firms who need to understand those consumer preferences. So we're talking about a whole new way of looking at data, not just using it to improve things internally, but as a valuable commodity, almost like a currency that can be bought, sold, and traded. You got it. And this isn't some futuristic fantasy. Companies are already generating serious income from their data, and this trend is only going to gain more momentum in the coming years. It's a big deal. This is huge. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, there's another piece of the puzzle to consider AI agents. The document paints a picture of a future where these AI agents are everywhere, automating tasks and even making decisions. How does this tie in with everything we've been talking about? It's all connected. We've talked about building that solid data foundation and recognizing the value of data as a product. Mm -hmm. Now imagine you've got this team of AI agents ready and waiting to put all that valuable data to work. So we're basically giving these AI agents the keys to the data kingdom and saying, all right, go make us smarter. But what does that look like in practice? How does it actually work? Well, it all comes down to what they call data activation. You see, it's not enough to just have mountains of data sitting around. You've got to make it usable, actionable, ready for those AI agents to put it to work. Okay, data activation. 
I've got to admit, that sounds a bit like something out of a sci-fi movie. Could you break that down for me? What are the steps involved? Sure, sure. Imagine this. You've got this state-of-the-art kitchen, top-of-the-line everything, but here's the catcher. The fridge is empty, the pantry's a disaster, and the knives totally dull. You're not going to be whipping up any Michelin star meals in that state, are you? Not a chance. Data activation is like prepping your data ingredients, getting everything ready for the AI shifts to work their magic. So no more dusty old cans of data hidden in the back of the pantry. Exactly. It starts with having that unified data ecosystem we talked about earlier, bringing all your data together in one place, making sure it's clean, organized, and properly labeled. Mm -hmm. Then you have to structure it in a way that these AI agents can actually understand. Think of it like writing out clear instructions that they can follow. So it's like we're taking our messy human way of organizing things and translating it into something these AI agents can actually work with. You got it. And that's a critical step. But let's shift gears a bit because once you've got this activated data and your AI agents all set to go, there's another big player in all of this, the cloud. The document seems to suggest that cloud computing is about to become even more essential for data analytics. What are your thoughts? Absolutely. And it, it makes sense if you think about it. Remember how we talked about those massive amounts of data involved in all of this? Well, storing, processing, and analyzing all that requires some serious computing power, the kind that most companies can't just build and maintain themselves. That's where the cloud swoops in to save the day. So it's like outsourcing your data center to those tech giants like Google or Amazon. Basically, yes. But it's more than just about storage space. Cloud platforms offer incredible processing power, flexibility, and scalability. Let's say you suddenly need more computing muscle for some complex AI analysis. No problem. You just spin up more servers in the cloud. It's like having an on-demand supercomputer at your beck and call. Wow. It's incredible how accessible that kind of power is these days. But it's not just about raw computing power, right? The document also mentions something about cloud computing enabling a new generation of native cloud analytics tools. You're sharp, yes. And these tools are built from the ground up to harness the full potential of the cloud. They're all about speed, agility, and processing data in real time. In the past, you might have had to run your analyses overnight and wait until the morning to get your results. But with these cloud-based tools, you get those insights instantly. It's like the difference between sending a letter and sending a text message. We're talking about making decisions based on what's happening right now, not yesterday's news. That speed must be a game changer for businesses. It is. That real-time decision-making is becoming mission critical in today's fast-paced business environment. But to really tap into the power of real-time analytics, you have to go beyond the cloud. You need to bring the analysis closer to the source of the data. That's where edge computing enters the picture. Okay, edge computing. I've heard the term, but I'm a little fuzzy on the details. Yeah. Is it like cloud computing's cooler, more mysterious cousin or something? Uh-huh, I like that. Okay, so picture this. Instead of sending all your data to the cloud for processing, you analyze it right there at the edge of the network, closer to where it's generated. Think sensors on a factory floor, analyzing data on machine performance in real time or self-driving cars making split-second decisions based on data from their surroundings. So instead of a round trip to the cloud and back, it's like the data gets analyzed right then and there, making it so much faster. You've got it. And that speed is critical for things like predictive maintenance, fraud detection, and even crafting those highly personalized customer experiences in the moment. It all sounds incredibly powerful. We're talking about a future where businesses can address issues before they even become problems and create experiences that feel almost magical for customers. Precisely. But here's the thing. To really interact with these increasingly sophisticated systems in a way that feels natural and intuitive, we need more than just keyboards and screens. We need to be able to actually talk to these systems, understand them, and have them understand us. That's where natural language processing, NLP for short, comes in. NLP. It seems like that acronym is popping up everywhere I turn these days. What's all the buzz about? It feels like NLP is going to be the bridge between us and these incredibly complex systems, letting us communicate in a way that feels almost human. Exactly. We're talking about teaching computers to go beyond just understanding the words we're using, but to actually grasp the meaning and intent behind them. Remember those clunky chatbots from a few years back? Right. You know, the ones that could barely handle a simple question. Oh, tell me about it. It felt like pulling teeth trying to get those things to understand anything. Did you mean fry instead of fly? So frustrating. Right. It was like talking to a wall sometimes. But thanks to NLP, those days are fading fast. Today's chatbots and virtual assistants are light years ahead. They're getting better at understanding context. 
picking up on your emotions, even holding a semi-natural conversation. It's like the difference between, well, talking to a wall and talking to something that's actually starting to get you. Still a way to go, but it's progress. Okay. But the document hinted that NLP is going to be so much bigger than just customer service, right? What else can we expect to see? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Imagine machines that can analyze legal contracts, summarize those super dense reports that nobody has time for, even write different kinds of creative content. And as NLP keeps evolving, the possibilities are kind of mind-blowing. I can see the appeal, but a part of me can't help but wonder, are robots going to be gunning for my job now? Huh. It's a question we're all asking ourselves these days. But honestly, I think the real opportunity here is to look at these technologies as powerful tools that can help us do our jobs even better, not replace us altogether. Like having a super-powered research assistant who can sift through mountains of data and pull out the insights that really matter. Now you're getting it. Speaking of insights, let's shift gears for a moment and talk about how all of this data is shaping those personalized experiences we're seeing more and more. Mm -hmm. You know, where it feels like a company can almost read your mind hopefully, in a good way. Right. Hyper-personalization, as yes. they call it. The document referred to it as Customer 360, which on one hand sounds incredibly powerful, but on the other hand, well, a little Big Brother-ish, you know? I hear you. It's like they have this 360-degree view of you as a customer, everything from your past purchases and browsing history to your social media activity, maybe even your location data. It's a lot. It is, but think about the potential. Imagine getting product recommendations that are so on point, it's like they were handpicked just for you. Or marketing messages that actually resonate with your interests instead of just adding to all the noise we're bombarded with every day. Exactly. Done right, hyper-personalization can create amazing experiences for customers, build loyalty, and of course, boost sales. Mm -hmm. But as you pointed out, there's a potential downside here too. Yeah, it's that fine line between, wow, you really get me, and okay, this is just creepy. Transparency is key, right? <laughs> customers need to know what's up. Absolutely. The document really emphasized the importance of transparency and control when it comes to this stuff. Customers need to know what data is being collected, how it's being used, and they should always have the option to opt out if they want to. No questions asked. It all boils down to trust. The moment customers feel like their privacy is being violated or a company is being shady with their data, that's when things go south. No doubt about it. Right. And that brings us to our final, and I'd argue most important, trend the role of privacy and governance in this data-driven world we're living in. It's like the ethical foundation for everything we've been talking about. We can talk about the amazing things data can do, but we can't forget about the responsibility that comes with it. Couldn't have said it better myself. And it's not enough to just have some policies in a dusty old binder somewhere. Companies need to bake ethical data practices into everything they do. It's about respecting customer privacy, being upfront about how data is being used, and making sure it's secure every step of the way. No excuses. And at the end of the day, it's not just about doing the right thing. It's also a smart business move. With regulations like GDPR and CCPA becoming the norm, privacy isn't optional anymore. It's the law, and customers are demanding it. They're savvy, they know their rights, and they're choosing to support businesses that align with their values. Transparency and responsibility aren't just buzzwords anymore. They're essential for building a sustainable and successful business in this data-driven future. So there you have it. We've covered a ton of ground in this deep dive AI, data as a product, the power of the cloud, the rise of edge computing, the incredible potential of NLP, the promise and the responsibility of hyper-personalization, and of course, the absolute necessity of ethical data practices. It's been quite a ride. It really has. And if there's one key takeaway from all of this, it's that the future of data isn't just about ones and zeros and algorithms. It's about people. So true. It's about using these incredible technologies to empower people, create meaningful experiences, and build a brighter future for everyone. Thanks for joining us on this adventure into the world of data. Until next time, stay curious. Thank you.